So after two wonderful and insightful talks, um, I'm happy to welcome Sasha Pufleb. He is an artist and design researcher whose work has been known to probe the role of technology in our efforts to understand and influence our environment. His interest extends across both historical aspects and visions of the future, and his practice often involves collaboration with other artists and researchers. Notable exhibitions include Talk to Me at MoMA New York, Micro Impact at the Beutschmann van Beunigen Museum in Rotterdam, and The House in the Sky at Brooklyn's Pioneer Works. Living and working between Berlin and La Jolla at CA, he is currently pursuing a PhD in art practice at the University of California, San Diego, as fellow of the Center of Academic Research and Training in Anthropo Anthropogeny, Qatar. So, welcome, Sasha Pufleb. Great, that actually saved me the first, the first slide almost. Um, I, I love the graph in the beginning where you pulled uh, who's who because I would probably identify as other. <laughs> um, and yeah, um, I do all these things. Um, this is my work website uh, if you want to have a look. Um, and um, I titled this talk uh, Prehensions. Like, like apprehensions. I realized that it caused like pretensions. It looks like pretensions, that's not what I mean. Um, and I wanna, I wanna preface it by saying I'm, I'm also one of these user people, so I don't necessarily work too much with the algorithms themselves, but I'm, I'm actually, I'm using them to kind of like create works that thematizes these things. And I typically have more questions than answers. Um, so um, some things I want to talk about. Um, and one hour is actually quite long, so um, let's see how long I'm going to go, but then maybe we have more time for discussion among ourselves as well. Um, I want to talk about what are those technologies? Um, where did some of their methods originate? How do they relate to us? And I want, I'm going to intersperse this with um, three works of my own. And essentially my ultimate question, which is also my research question right now, and, and this PhD I'm doing it, uh, UC San Diego is um, what does it mean cr to create something de novo from these things, right? And and if this is even possible, so can, could you use these technologies to actually create something in a sense of creativity that didn't exist before in the world? Um, which I think is a very interesting and very open question. First substrate. Artificial neural networks originated in Walter Pitts and Warren McCulloch's caricature model of an artificial neuron, uh, proposed in a paper called A Logical Calculus of the Ideas Imminent in Nervous Activity from 1943, which is widely regarded as the theoretical foundation of AI. Norbert Wiener, the mathematician, was one of the great proponents of Walter Pitts, since, and this is a quote, Wiener realized that it ought to be possible for Pitts neural networks to be implemented in man-made machines ushering in his dream of a cybernetic revolution. He knew if such a model were embodied in a machine, that that machine could learn. That's from a really beautiful article in Nautilus magazine called The Man Who Tried to Redeem His World, The World with Logic, which is kind of a nice um, connection to, to Anna's talk maybe as well. Um, so in the 1980s, such purely digital models of living logic were abandoned in favor of a more analog and gradual model of neural computing. And that's actually where this idea of the post-binary comes in very nicely. But then again, also not really because of the simulation of it. So you have a digital simulation of something analog, which may be post-binary. And today, as we saw, increasingly multi-dimensional networks of parameters can embody a weight build in a mineral substrate, or can it? So we have somehow managed to operationalize an ontology that originates in processes that remain rather alien, even though they're likely constitu to constitute the very self of us. So what you see running in the background uh, is actually a real neural network in action. And I got it from YouTube, like most of these clips. Um, and, <laughs> and there was this amazing comment on it, 
the first comment on the YouTube videos, which was, so this is basically what we are, these signals. I feel so strange now. Where is the magic to life when you realize you're actually a super complex, complex wired organic system? It's so fucking cool to see this. So in the sense that, that a neural network can replicate some of the features, or not features, let's say effects of these, um, is something you could call existence proof. But it's still a model, or it still is a model. But now in a sense it stands in front of us, it's gazing back and it's gathering data for training purposes. Two, the gym. It's quite dark. Um, <clears throat> but what does it mean to learn something? What does it mean to train something for something? Will humans always be involved? I actually personally think so. But is what? So in what layer are we going to be part of this? Um, what does it mean to train and what does it mean to be trained on? Which relates to the data set creation that, that we heard about. So what does it mean to provide the data for these things or to basically be the face of one of these data sets? Which, I mean, it's, it has become clear in the discussion of recent months, it's inherently problematic. Um, and what's the moment of recognition? Like both the recognition of the machine of us, but also the recognition of maybe there's something going on in the machine. So in this video that you can kind of make out um, is Gary Kasparov versus Deep Blue, which is this legendary chess moment, right, when, when the first human was comprehens comprehensively beat by a machine. Um, it was quite beautiful because Car this is a moment when Kasparov gets up and like walks out angrily of the room. Um, because, and the reason why he was angry, according to himself later in interviews, is not that he lost, but that he thought that IBM didn't actually have like purely computer beat him, but they had, a, they had an army of weaker players than him, and kind of like his, his an enemies, but like nameless enemies, plus a computer, right? Um, and this, this repeated itself later. And I wonder whether there's a word for that specific fallacy where you know, you encounter something that can do something that only you can do and it just makes you angry, right? And you're, you're in disbelief, you're, you're, you're rejected basically. Um, capture. So what does it mean to truly capture reality? Because as we just very correctly heard, that's the dream. Um, so many of the techniques of machine learning operate with the notion of a multidimensional space and often two-dimensional space, actually, um, that can be captured, sensed, sense abstracted, reduced, and described in a way that can be recognized, that can be used to recognize and predict something. So descriptive models, predictive models, projective models. But how many dimensions are actually needed to sufficiently recognize a phenomenon? Um, this became clear to me at um, NIPS that, that Luba had kindly invited me to. Um, where an engineer, I don't actually remember his name, I don't know if I want to mention his name, um, gave a talk and he had this amazing graph, um, which he showed basically how you can split the world in art <coughs> and non-art, right? And it's clearly just this two-dimensional distribution and what's inside of it is art and what's outside of it, outside of it is, is non-art. And you can, um, incor like, and doesn't actually quote, incorporate the feedback of art critics into the loss function to improve the algorithm. Um, end quote, to then make more optimal art. <laughs> I think this is too simplistic. <laughs> I, th I think, it, did I, I think actually, can't, like, didn't I get the microphone say, like, this could be art, and then he was like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Um, <laughs> so, yeah, there's more. But then, if you look at something like this, um, which is a video from the um, Kamitami lab at Kyoto University, um, where this researcher, the PI, um, I don't actually know his first name, Kamitani, works on, on things that are essentially reconstructions of visual images from human brain activity as measured by an fMRI, fMRI so functional magnetic reson resonance imaging, um, of people uh, looking at, at videos and also thinking of videos. So this is essentially or like to explain the whole process, so you have a you have a person looking at a, an image, a moving image, or even thinking of a moving image, and they're in an fMRI machine that produces data, which then in your own network it's trained on, and then you take away the 
image. No. Yeah, you take away the image and the person thinks of the image and the neural network can actually interpret the neural information from the live fMRI data. So you can read somebody's mind with that. Um, <coughs> so mind reading for all intents and purposes, the ability to, to display thoughts and dreams. Um, is that the threshold of the threshold of true emergence and how to relate to that, <coughs> how, not to, how not to be related to that? So the first own work I want to show is called Deep Unlearning. And games play an important role in all of these things. So as benchmarks for intelligence, but also as a common platform on which these synthetic models can be directly encountered. Um, and actually many, many of these games or learning things are rooted in Cold War game theory. So competitive configurations between two agents who strive a, 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 towards an optimal state. Um, which, for example, is the generative adversarial network, um, the GAN. You know, so there's two entities basically that compete for an optimal state between them, or from one perspective. So think of the prisoner's dilemma, or the things that came out of the think tanks in the 1950s, which, in a very interesting way, relate straight back to Freud's pre-war, uh, pre-war pre Vienna. How to be captured, how not to be captured. Um, but what it, what would it mean to unlearn? being human to some extent, to become less readable or more readable or differently readable. Um, so essentially, in relation to this, in response to this, um, my collaborator Chris Webkin and I have created a process that we call Deep Unlearning, which we wanted to be playful, safe, self-alienation self-aliena in order to gain a tiny measure of access to, to these things. And. Um, this is specifically drawing on a workshop we conducted in September 2017 at the New Lab in New York City, <coughs> where participants were tasked to write algorithmic instructions of unlearning, um, which they all interpreted in, very different, in a very different way. Um, and for the first, so, and then we essentially analyzed all these algorithmic um, um, instructions that people were using and designed a card game which by self-randomization through shuffling, so if you imagine like a card game, you know, shuffle it. This is essentially like a way of almost like taking your intentionality out of it, right? So you make sure that the card game almost doesn't have any trace of you as a human in it. Um, and it, it creates almost three billion possible algorithmic instructions, which is also, which is not unlike the instruction pieces of the Fluxus area. So you can essentially lay cards and the cards make these often nonsensical things. Um, so certain measure of nonsense, nonsensicality is expected um, because this is precisely the boundary where, where we hope the unlearning is takes place and where irrational meaning might emerge. Um, and it also relates to what I just said, is um, techniques of randomization, <coughs> which are techniques of divination, which is also something really interesting. So the casting of lots, hunting, predicting the future, which then loops back to the predictive models. So maybe these things are actually the oracles of our times. Um, and then also language. So um, natural language does not emerge naturally at all, um, as that um, the slide we just saw about the the creepy uh, what was it called the creepy the the creepy bots that created their own language. <coughs> so the actual title of the lang uh, the actual title title of the research paper um, by Facebook Research was "Natural Language Does Not Emerge Naturally," um, but it's actually and it's not the title, but it's actually a virus from outer space. As, as Will and Boris knew, but there's something in language that doesn't actually quite belong to us. Maybe. Feedback. So what does it mean when things look back at us? And will our relationship to them change the way we are? Consider, for example, Richard Wrangham's cooking hypothesis, um, according to which the human animal's control of fire has, via the practice of cooking, subtly yet irreversibly changed all a human physiognomy. Human physiognomy. Um, two small molars, molars uh, back and zähne, um, mouth, stomach, and large intestine, a change that was so powerful that it became the very basis for population survival. Which essentially means that this, uh, the, invent or like the control of fire and the invention of cooking has completely changed our bodies in a way that we could not exist without it anymore. And maybe 
these kind of recursive effects are going to happen again. Um, so recursion from 2016 um, is a piece that was performed by Erika Ostrander um, based on a, or using a text that was generated by an LSTM recurrent neural network back then created by Andrew, Carp Andrew Carpathy, who's now head of AI at Tesla. And it was generated through, not through semantic understanding, so it's, it's a ne network called CharRNN um, that, that parses texts and can replicate or can, can generate new texts. Um, not because it understands the text, but because it models the probability distribution of the next character in the sequence given a sequence of previous characters. Which means you give it a text and, and it makes actual language just by predicting the likeliness of an A following a B, right? Which is crazy that something can emerge from that. <clears throat> so the material I was trained on contained texts about humanity. So in encyclopedia entries on humanity, consciousness, economy, emotion, science, technology, the human body, and human behavior. Um, Freud's um, Das Unbehagen in der Kultur, Johnny Mitchell's California, the sun, the Beatles, Here Comes the Sun, Mary Douglas' Purity and Danger, um, and a bunch of other songs. Human in the supply and substance, the sense of the positive importance and the simple distinction of the good form of the economy and the study of the production of the model of the subject of the part of the sense of the reality of any social contract to the divine and the single interest of the power of the sense of the consciousness, of the self-consciousness of its own self, which is the reality of the sexual self-consciousness, is the self that is the sense and the self that is the actual and more consciousness of the other is not the way in this world is a self-consciousness as the I is its own alter, the self-consciousness is its own doing and the significance of its own essence, which is despite the reality and the present, the substance is the substance and the other, so that considerable to its experience, which we not the self as a self-consciousness is the substance, is this construction of this reality, which is a single individual and a self-consciousness as such in the self, that is the substance in the ethical consciousness is only the content of the behavior of the sphere of the same self of the other world, is the being of the century, the same time, the animals and the actualization of the consciousness, the one, the standard of the scientific things, the action of the same time, the means of the self is actually the doubt, the actuality of its own self at the self-consciousness is a man, the existence of the behavior of the species of the benefit and the significance of society and others, individuals as the self-consciousness is the external and the self of something further sensuous might be in the same time, in the same time the actual world, the development of the strong thinking of the species of the self and how the single individual for the sensations of the subject of the culture, each other. So in a sense, um, there's a reversal in exploration of the limit of us. Kind of a reverse shot of swords, a question for both interfaciality and embodiment. And that's so Anna's, Anna's work just blew me away because in a sense the last thing you showed is very similar to that because you almost like fed the result of the neural network back into your process, right? Which is kind of exactly what I'm, what I'm trying to get at here because if you think about algorithmically, human reflects herself in machine, both machine and language, even though language is unclear, but definitely machine. Language is simulated by machine. A human is modulated through machine, as you can just saw, where Erica becomes a little bit robotic by reading this text, both because the text is robotic, but also because it's like a little bit too fast. Um, and then it's go to a one, right? So like it loops back. Um, so it means it's a mimetic other, an apophenic alien um, into which your minds probably just attempted to read meaning, right? And apophenia, this idea that, that um, we have an inherent tendency to see patterns, right? Um, but as Sadie Plant says, a computer which passes the Turing test is always more than a human intelligence. Simulation always takes the mimic over the brink. 
Um, and according to Turing in 1951, patterns are the basis of, m of morphogenesis. And another strange example of patterns is of offered by philosopher David Wallace as he considers the implications of the so-called uh, so many worlds inter interpretation of Hugh Everett in quantum physics. And he points out that while tigers are unquestionably real in any reasonable sense of the word, they are certainly not part of the basic ontology of any physical theory. Um, that means there might be no such thing as a tiger itself, but he instead proposes that a tiger constitutes something akin to an ontology of a higher order, that a tiger is any pattern which actually behaves like a tiger, and that all such patterns are, are regarded to be real, which means that if you have something that can generate a tiger, it's kind of a tiger, right? <laughs> Maybe. Um, <coughs> The third piece, um, Spacewalk 2017. Um, two artificial intelligences arranged in um, Ian Goodfellow's GAN configuration that we heard about many times today already um, play a game with almost 3,000 networks of predatory animals, which I took from the image net that we just saw, um, in order to find what patterns could emerge. And taking a walk in the so called lateral space of the resulting network, the hazy image of something appears. It's also the worst trained gun you'll ever see. Um, is Mario here already? I have no idea what he looks like. No, I'm, s I'm very glad about this actually. Because <laughs> he's at the other end of the spectrum. Um, but the human eye perhaps finds itself in a moment of mis misapprehension. So the machine constructs the image and we construct another image out of what we think we are seeing. So this is our own capacity for false beliefs. Um, which made sense evolutionarily because if we perceived a predator, we had to act as if it's actually there. So in statistics, it's called uh, type one or type two error. And it's more, I don't know which one's which, but if you, the type one error can make many times, the type two error can only make once. Yeah, because then it's actually the tiger. So it's more costly to, it's less costly to think that you left on the oven and go back, right? Um, as it is to like leave it on once and the house burns down. Is this superstition then? Or maybe a trace of Dennis Criterion? And what are patterns, by the way? And that's actually one of my main questions right now. So what, what's a pattern? Because it's actually, it's a pretty unclear thing. Um, it seems as if the history of what we see and what we fail to see, we have in that history, we have perhaps somewhat accidentally in an, an act of self-simulation um, uh, um, not only begun to produce entities um, that exhibit the same fallacies as, as ourselves. So para-neural networks are what you could, could call para-anthropogenic, right? Because they're, they're artificial and not, in a strange sense, or they're anthropogenic and not. Um, so they're, they're para, para anthropogenic in nature, yet they're suggesting there's something like a truly post -anthropo anthropocentric reality. Um, where sapiens, in the cl classical sense, or the sapiens in the sense that we like to apply it to us, ourselves as a species, may exist beyond our species in the medium term future. So that would be the general purpose of artificial intelligence. Um, but I mean, maybe there's other intelligences as well, right? So it's, I think it's equally a fallacy to think that it's only there um, if it talks to you about the weather and can, you know, or it's, it's the sapiens that doesn't look like us, which something like the octopus clearly demonstrates. But, but the question is also, would we be able to see it? You know, we're not, we don't know what we're looking for, essentially. So. <clears throat> That's where xenobiology comes in, these things like that. So unless you have another example for sapiens than human, you don't actually quite know what you're looking for. Or you don't know when you see it, when you see it. Yeah. If you see it, when you see it. Um, so when Google DeepMind, um, unless the sa second wave of the, the ludic shock and awe with AlphaGo, um, which is kind of the the mirror image or the, the, the second iteration of the Kasparov moment that you just saw. Um, and you probably know about this, right? That Alpha and um, AlphaGo, the Go computer 
beat a uh, human player. Um, what's his name again? Um, what's his name? Lisedor, yeah. Beat Lisedor. <coughs> um, big news item. Because um, Go is was regarded more complicated than, or more complex than, than chess. Um, so, and at the time the Wall Street Journal reported um, of a young Mr. K um, writing on Chinese platform Weibo that, quote, humanity had spent thousands of years improving our tactics and computers tell us that humans are completely wrong, leading him to the conclusion that not a single human has touched the edge of Go, the edge of the truth of Go. And there was this beautiful moment when, um, and it was move 37, all right, when, when um, and it is always 37 for some strange reason. <laughs> and so move 37 basically came out of nowhere and then decided the game later on. I don't know, uh, I don't know anything about Go, don't, you know, I'm just kind of inter interpreting this, but, but move 37 essentially was a very alien move that no human, or like in the kind of good strategy of Go, nobody had ever considered. And this AlphaGo played that move and then kind of decided the game for itself. Which causes like strange, um, this strange mix of shock and admiration in the in the public of Go. And compare that to Kasparov, right? Um, so maybe humanity doesn't have a monopoly on innovation and creativity either, because um, we we always think that humans are inherently creative, right? Or that we we kind of exist as this creative force. But for example, if you consider the Acheulean age with the Acheulean hand axe that you see being made, being napped there, <coughs> um, which approximately lasted from 1.5 million years to about 800,000 years ago, um, and where a leading paleoanthropologist recently liked it to the, to the place for, <coughs> sorry, to the place from the Talking Heads song Heaven. Heaven, heaven is a place, a place where nothing, nothing ever happens. So in that whole time from 1.5 million years ago to about 800,000 years ago, technology did not change, right? So people had these, made these things and there was no innovation to them, you know? So why, why do we think that we, we kind of like own creativity and why do we think that machines cannot do that? It could also be the other way around. Um, which brings us to the, back to the Gans and, and the question I would actually have, maybe also for discussion. So Ian Goodfellows, the creator of the GANS, says, or said at, at NIPS as well, last December, quote, GANS fit in things that are not available to the senses. They can imagine. But is that true? Are we looking at interpolations, interpolations between the layers of possible states? Or are we looking at something else? Another person who was part of this 1980s moment that I mentioned earlier recently told me, Feedback is just feedback. I'm not sure. Um, I, would, no, I, I would actually like to speak to somebody who's doing the algorithms, because like, the closer you are to the algorithms, um, maybe the closer you are to a feeling of what's going on there. But what if not? I mean, or what if yes, rather? So what if, the, what if these are the alien or the things that exist between the layers of it in, like the, in the lateral space that many of these artworks actually activate or use. Um, what if that's actually the alien prehensions of the, of the neural networks? Which means, will we notice them? Um, do we actually need the games to see them? So the, ca the game is a common denominator of a reduced world, the game of a model as a world to be able to see the machine creativity because you maybe wouldn't see it in the, in the real world because it's too complex, so it's only in a um, so maybe it's only at this point, maybe it's only in a, it's only a game like chess or go that a machine can capture this, but maybe it also works reversely. Maybe it's only in a game that we can actually identify these little divergence that mean creativity. Um, and what is the aesthetic space and language proper? I don't know. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much already. Very inspiring, interesting, and questioning job. 
um, yeah, more questions than answers. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Um, so what are the questions from the, uh, from the audience about it? Move uh, 37. Um, is it probably just something another human might have come up with and which was just not heard? That's one question. I'm adding more questions to the questions. And um, also, um, I think what's the creative act and go and except playing it, it's inventing the game. And I've never heard about an AI system actually inventing a game. Okay, yeah, that's, that's two very, yeah, that's two very good. Um, so I think the, the first part, the first question relates to the idea that there's, I mean, there's like this space of possibilities, right? So if you imagine, if you imagine this square <coughs> that said capture, let's say like that's the space, the, the space of all possible moves, which in Go is ginormous, right? And it's like greater than the atoms in the universe. Or something. I think this is really like that. So that's why, and, and that's what you start off with in Go, and then it constrains itself. Um, with chess, you can essentially always calculate to the end of the, almost like almost to the end of the game with available computing power. So that's why Go was created, was considered difficult. But if you imagine something like that, then you could say you could say that what exists is essentially like the space that humans have so far imagined, right? And then that machine jumped somewhere else. But that's also really interesting because that's in many ways how biology works because often it's the outliers you know there's a, like the mutation is is the deviation from the norm that then feeds back into the mainstream of the phenotype right so that's something really interesting and, and so how did the machine get there right so i think nobody actually thinks from my limited knowledge of go no, of go nobody actually thinks that that any of these things were or like the, this move 37 was unimaginable it was just outrageously unusual, right? So it basically created, created this data point that then offset the whole game. Um, the second point is actually really interesting because it, you mean what you say that is that um, could it create the game, which I'm also very interested in. Um, but um, I think that means the, that, that kind of relates to the, one of the things I was saying in the beginning, whether so I think humans are always going to be there, but they're going to be there as creators of the frameworks, right? So essentially, like the the, the idea of creativity might level up or level down depending on how you how you look at it. And essentially, you draw the it's it's the the entity that um, draws the systemic boundaries, right? Because the systemic boundaries for this is essentially the idea of the game. Right, and then in in that space you can like this and it does diff there's different agents that might be natural or artificial that do something. But then to create this framework is actually the creative act. Um, I would totally agree with that actually. Yeah. So you, you showed this perhaps provocative image of the circle of art within the non art. Um, and I think we had some nice discussions last night with Anna and Luba about you know, what actually makes art art, and especially in this space. Um, yeah, perhaps you can elaborate some, somewhat on, on your thoughts on this. And I mean, perhaps on a specific example, like, I mean, lots of people in computer science generate cool stuff right now. Is that art already, or what, what does turn it into art? Um, yeah, um, oh, the art question. Um, <laughs> 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 well, I think um, so. Art kind of relates very directly to the game because maybe art is one of these games, right? Which means you can read, you can redefine it, and you can, um, yeah, you can read, you can always redefine it, right? Which means it is evading, so the point of art is to evade, capture, the, the, the point of art is a cultural technique in human society, in human sociality. I think you always have to like bracket it with, this is something that humans do, right? Um, <laughs> probably, um, <coughs> likely. Um, 
so you have to see in that context and, and the point, I think one of the points of it, the point, one of the functions in human sociality is to evade that capture, right, that this person was suggesting, which makes it comical, but the person didn't realize because he was very honest about it, you know, he, you know, he said like, well, this is clearly something we can, we can solve, right, but the point is obviously like to not do that, but it's, it's almost like a thing that you can point at things, like Oren Katz, the, the um, artist who works with biology said a couple of weeks ago to me that he thinks that art is a license to actually do things that don't work in other frameworks. So almost like it's the meta framework basically um, that you can then apply to figure out other things, all right? But it's, it's you know, it's, it's an unanswerable question because it's, it's the thing that's nothing, but it is something, all right? So it's kind of, um, yeah, I'm, I'm being very evasive on purpose, <laughs> but, but I think you know what I'm getting, right? Like, the, I, I think you can use many of these, you know, um, you can use many of, things, many of these things in an art context, but then it's not possible to kind of like completely capture the space because the construction of the space is the actual practice, much like the games. 